this is Curtis George from hey. John DeGroff and Friends and Salt. This is John DeGroff, and uh, most of you know me from Petra, GHF, and Salt. And this is the Covenant Metal Show. Hey guys, I am here with John DeGroff and Curtis George. Now you guys, uh, some of you may or may not know, uh, but John was the original bass player for Petra back in the 70s, and uh, you played on, uh, I believe, two albums, correct? Yeah, the first two, the self-titled Petra, the one with the sandbox-type cover, and the second one was called Come to Join Us. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, now John plays bass, and Curtis, you play drums, correct? Correct, yep. Awesome. Now, how did you guys meet? Well, um, we're, we're here in Warsaw, Indiana, and I moved here in 2006 when I got married and started playing with this guy named Gary Girard, a uh, three-piece band that uh, does classic rock and blues and, you know, played some of the local areas, local clubs. And Curtis was one of the drummers, the last drummer that the band had. We went through a series of drummers and kept the band a three-piece and the first gig that uh, Curtis played uh, we just started talking and just hit it off because uh, he's only 28 years old and he's into the music that I grew up with and his his musical background is just phenomenal and what's unique is his uncle Dave Oliver played with um, Sean Browning's band Grave Rock Ah, okay. And when we and Dave actually played with the Gary Gerard group, he was one of uh, the the drummers that we had. And when Dave decided he didn't want to do it anymore, he recommended Curtis and did a couple pickup gigs right before Dave decided to leave. And it just worked out so well, and we hit it off so well that uh, when I decided, you know, before I get too old, I want to do my own thing, and I needed a drummer who understood prog rock, understood jazz, understood understood a little bit more than just three chord rock, and he's the man. Awesome. True story. <laughs> right mm -hmm. on. <laughs> Check that yeah. back, checkers. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey guys, I have here in my hands a copy of uh, your newest album, John. Uh, John DeGroff and Friends, uh, Trophy Hunting for Unicorns. Uh, otherwise known as Salt 2. Interesting uh, title for the album, Trophy Hunting for Unicorns. Did that just come out of nowhere, or uh, was that a title you kind of had floating around in your head there for a while? Well, I'll, I'll let you answer this. I have some thoughts, but go being for it. Into, <laughs> being into prog rock, uh, I have one notebook where I just write down bizarre titles that might work for an instrumental. But most of the work that we've done on the first album in this new one there's more instrumental material than there is vocal material and so i'm always coming up with off the wall really ridiculous sounding titles and that was one of them and i thought you know that that title is so stupid sounding it'll work so i figured why not my album i'll call it what i want so <laughs> there you have it very cool and you know speaking of strange you know names for titles uh just going off of the back of the cd here you've got uh anachronistic anachronism as one of them uh, that's probably one of my favorite tunes honestly i love oh, that great. one uh and then you've got uh please don't feed the rhino r-i-n-o <laughs> um overall you know it's it's a great album and i like the diversity and sound in it yeah. and you know uh the covenant metal show obviously the the theme of the show is in the title itself primarily i play metal and hard rock on the show but uh it's just something about your music just really touches me and it's like you know what i don't care you know i run the show i'm gonna play john de Groff and friends and uh, so why don't we uh if you don't mind let's let's go way back decades man uh to the beginning of petra uh can you explain you know your involvement in the project and uh your your tenure with petra well petra started in fort wayne indiana in 1972 
and I had graduated high school in May of 1972. Bob Hartman had, uh, well, first of all, let me back up just a bit. I'm from a little town called West Unity, Ohio. It's 50 miles due west of Toledo, where Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan come together on the map. And Bob Hartman lived in a town called Bryan, Ohio, which was bigger than West Union. It's our county seat. He's four or five years older than me, and he was the, the local guitar star that we would all go see play in whatever band he had at the moment. And Bob became a Christian probably about 1970. I became a Christian in 1971. And we started hanging out together, and Bob and I actually had a band, a Christian band together called Rapture, while I was still in high school. And it was during that point in time that we bumped into Greg Hogue uh, through a married couple that he was friends with. We had Bible studies at Bob's house and uh, I show up one day and there's this, this guy with hair down to his waist playing a Les Paul through a Marshall, just, just going absolutely crazy loon type playing. Every now, now it's called shredding. <laughs> and um, that was my introduction to Greg Hogue. Well, Rapture didn't last that long, not even a year. And so when I graduated high school, I had um, missed the opportunity to apply for a college. And I figured, well, now, OK, what am I going to do now? And over in Fort Wayne, Indiana, there was a church called Calvary Temple. And they had a, um, a ministry towards youth that was called the Adam's Apple. And there was a two-year junior Bible college. And I figured, well, okay, I'm going to go to Bible college. I just really felt that's what the Lord wanted me to do. So I moved over there. And about a month after I moved over, Bob and Greg started working together. And then they moved over. And within uh, a month, not even six weeks, we had a band together. We bumped in. I bumped into Bill Glover the very first night I was in Fort Wayne. Wow. He had seen... He had seen Bob and I play in Rapture, and he recognized me and asked me to come to a jam session. And uh, I wasn't able to, but we, we started talking. And it, the, the four of us just kind of got together, and we all ended up at Christian Training Center one way or another. And the very first gig that Petra ever did, it was with a guy named John Lloyd, who was the uh, director of the Adam's Apple. And do you know who Nancy Honeytree is? No, I'm sorry. No. Okay. <laughs> she had one of the first, she came out on Murr Records before we did. She's a singer-songwriter, and her stuff is more folky, but uh, she, she got very, very well received by early uh, CCM music audiences. And so it was Nancy Honeytree and John Lloyd, and then the four of us, we played at high school assembly in Bryan, Ohio, where Bob graduated from high school, and I was just down the road from West Unity. Bob had not come up with the name Petra yet. We were just there. It was the first time we ever played in front of people. And we started playing, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, we started playing through the Adam's Apple and started, you know, back then, you did not have a network of uh, Christian music venues. You did not have massive tours. You know, everything you know about Christian music now did not exist then. You know, when you say Christian music, back then it was pretty much, well, it was what was in your hymn book. It was Southern Gospel. It was a bunch of church musicals written by a guy named Ralph Carmichael. Now, one of the first uh, Ichthus festivals, I did find out it was held in Kentucky in 1969. But I, I've never seen a, a list of who played for that. So it was probably... There wasn't much going on in the way of rock in Christian music. In fact, Petra got, we got canceled more times once, uh, you know, people started saying, well, rock, you can't use rock for God. Yeah. And when the second Petra album came out, you know, with the song God Gave Rock and Roll to You, which was an Argent tune, and Hartman rewrote the words and we put it out there where a lot of people said, God gave rock and roll to you. No, he didn't. <laughs> we, we, we got canceled quite a bit. People just did not we're not able to wrap their heads around the fact that uh, any genre of music can be used for the Lord. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's all there is to it. I mean, I have always said, go sit down at a piano or pick up a guitar, whatever you can play, play a C chord. Now, is that C chord 
Is that a secular C chord or a sacred C chord? It's neither. It, it's just a collection of tones I like that, that arbitrarily over the years, somebody started assigning uh, a way to delineate all these musical tones. And that goes back to like, I think the 1200s or 1100s when music first started being written. Well, and, and, and it's like, I remember, you know, uh, one of the first verses, you know, music related that really stuck with me is Psalm 33, verse three, sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud noise. And, and absolutely right there. Well, one of the first promotional things we put out, it was this little tiny open, open it up flyer thing with the name Petra and who we were. And we used that skillfully with a loud noise. Amen. And, <laughs> and it was kind of like trying to explain what we're doing to church people who are more used to Southern gospel and Ralph, Ralph Carmichael musicals, you know, um, it just, people just kind of didn't know what to do with this. And in fact, uh, Word Records who had the Murr label, they didn't know what to do with us. And that first album, um, it was just the four of us, you know, Petra didn't have a main lead singer like like they ended up with. Bob and Greg did the vocals. And I'm surprised that even now people will, I see things posted all the time about, this is one of my favorite Christian albums and this thing holds up really well and all that. And it's just really hard to wrap my head around that. But first album came out in 1974. And like I said, they they did not know what to do with us. It didn't get the promotion. I mean, the only way that we promoted it was to go out and play. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until 1977 that the second Petra album came out and we almost didn't get to do it. And in fact, just to give you the idea of where the mindset was, Bob had written a song called Killing My Old Man. And it's taken from the verse in Romans. I'm, I'm not good with chapter and verse memorizing but it's a thing where paul says i have to die daily to my old man my old nature and that's what the song was about killing my old man well the record company took one look at the title and said uh -uh, no 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 we're not releasing the album with that on it <laughs> and we were going to call it god gave rock and roll to you um and they wouldn't let us do that either so wow. as a last ditch effort we came out with well okay come and join us that was one of the other songs Wow. Which is a great, it's a great record name if I can comment here. Um, yeah. Obviously the, the invitation uh, for such a divine and, and powerful purpose, um, I think is just fantastic. And um, seeing that, you were well, rather thinking about the era of John just talking about how you can't imagine rock and roll being associated with uh, Christ or his teachings. Um, it's really is really bizarre so that record names uh quite brilliant actually to you know to, to invite one and uh how special it can be when you combine the two well and then you look at what happened from that time period to what but like you're you're very familiar with rottweiler records and what sean does oh yeah absolutely correct? okay well we could not have done any of that we would have been tarred and feathered and then, then they would have shot us but <laughs> <laughs> we could not have pulled off that type of music and bands and a band like striper or some of the really heavy bands that ended up you know becoming mainstream in christian music um we couldn't do that that you know we were just we were kind of on a fine line between acceptance and rejection every time yeah they, i i believe you know uh uh striper was one of the first uh if not the first rock band to basically uh be accepted in the mainstream you know, yeah, uh, and, in the mainstream and, and I, a, a I, lot I, of that was yeah. due to MTV, you know, at the time. I've read enough stuff uh, from from Michael, some of his, po some, no, pardon me, some of his postings, where he said, yeah, they were getting accepted with MTV and getting accepted in the mainstream, but Christians would still look down on them. Yeah. So they were still having to fight that battle. And even to this day, I've still seen people say, well, you know, you really have to think about what you're doing and my my attitude is listen you know go back to the, the secor thing is it secular or sacred it's what you the lyrics will make it that way but absolutely yes going going back to musical history uh there was a time when bach was writing that it was considered sinful the church considered it sinful to play in a major key 
because dance music and worldly music was in a major key. So you had to play in a minor key. And I can't tell you the titles, but there's a couple of well-known pieces of, of Bach's music. It would start in the minor. He'd switch it over and play the entire thing in the major, and then the coda would be back into the minor. <laughs> and they just didn't get it. But musicians have always had to fight against what the world says. No, you can't do this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you think about, have you seen Sean's band, Grave Robber? Oh, yeah, I saw them live I mean, twice. <laughs> that, that's just brilliant thinking. Absolute brilliant yeah. thinking. And Sean has told me that he's had people come up to him and say, oh, that, that's of the devil. You guys look like the devil. And Sean had one comment. Some lady got on his case about how they how they dressed in their costumes, and he said he told her he said, "Listen, in Scripture, Satan is called an angel of light. He's he's beautiful. He's accepted. He's not this demonic looking thing. Um, it, it's it's not what people think it would be. No, he's and not red so with a pitchfork." Yeah, they're they're more superficial uh, judgments if they are to make that because grave robbers obviously not only does the name come from you know Petra, it comes from a Petra song yeah which is pretty credible the grave robber name but um yeah I mean his band serves as like a Trojan horse of sorts at, at least on the superficial level um so and that's I don't know it's sort of in the role of an artist hopefully be honest and uh, challenging and maybe a Trojan horse isn't the best example in that light but. It, it, it makes great sense with what Ray, how Gray Robert looks for a start, you know. And, right. and he told me one time that he feels he has a ministry to, absolutely, you know, to these kids that are all tatted up, you know, and they're they've got a T-shirt with skulls all over it, and a church doesn't even want them on the property because of the way they look. Yeah. And he feels, listen, it doesn't matter what a person looks like; they have a soul. They need the Lord. Yep. You know, and Gray Robert is one that. of those bands that. You know they're not what they appear to be and that and yeah. i mean that in the, in a good way absolutely you know like you said you see them up on stage and you know they're dressed like zombies they got the skeleton faces and everything and and they have you know their stage names but if you pay close attention to the lyrics and the songs they all point to hope they all point to christ yeah i i've often said grave Grave Robber makes the Walking Dead look like GQ models. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> They're just, I mean, that is so off the wall. And we could not have done that. But I've, my wife pretty much got her life back on track at a Petra concert after she heard John Schlitt's testimony. Wow. And she always tells me, well, you need to focus on the fact that what the seeds that you planted are still maturing. And I just can't wrap my head around that sometimes. But, you know, we were, you know, you've heard the phrase a pioneering ministry. Yeah. And that's basically, I guess, what we were at that point in time. Mm hmm. Absolutely. You know, and uh, I remember, you know, I, I had heard of Petra in the 80s, but I had never really heard any of the music. And of course, uh, you know, I, I, you know, everybody, me and my friends, everybody, we all knew about Striper. So that was my introduction to Christian rock music was Striper. And yeah. even then, it was like I knew they were about the Lord and everything, but uh, I wasn't receiving the message. To me, it, they were just like any other rock band at the time. And, uh, you know, I didn't come to the Lord till many, many, many years later. Uh, but. Uh, you know, when I did get a chance to listen to uh, Petra, you know, my my introduction to Pet Petra was the Beyond Belief album, and which to this day, you know, usually the first song you hear from a band will always be your favorite. The first album yeah. you hear from a band will always be your favorite, and that's mm -hmm. the case. But I did go back and I listened to the older stuff with with uh, Greg singing, and I love it. I love all of it. I really do. And now, uh, uh, 
Curtis, uh, what is yeah. what's what's uh, your experience like? What other projects besides uh, you know doing projects with John and Salt? Uh, what other projects have you been involved in? Well, for a start, um, yeah, definitely working with John is my main mo. Um, apart from that, uh, on the personal front, I'm working on a project in California with a producer out there. Um, the working title is so far called Animus. Um, and that's the, uh, the impetus behind that is trying to meld the world of electronics and acoustic instruments. Wow. Um, uh, which to me is infinitely fascinating. And then of course, as Express, John and I play in lo a local band, play bars, clubs, that type of thing. Um, just to consistently play live. Um, I recently joined a metal band called Hailshot. Um, which is a bit challenging because all these years I'm working on fusion chops and listening to progressive rock and uh, the <laughs> dexterity uh, was kind of lost on me. In my youth I had it, I played in a lot of punk bands and quite worshipped the heavy metal and punk genre for many years of my youth. Um, but those uh, chops left me on trying to get those back. So um, I think those are the more uh, the significant ones. But throughout my life, I think starting probably around the age of... Uh, Oh geez, maybe 14, 15, I've been playing drums in live bands and uh, playing at local venues since that age, you know, any venue that was didn't have to be 21 and up. Um, I played with <laughs> indie bands and in garages and punk bands. And so it's a it's a constant uh, mode of uh, being an inspiration in my life for sure. Awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, it really is. Out of out of curiosity, mm -hmm. um, unless you had uh, you had something there. Uh, how long have you had the show? Uh, I started it in January of 2015. So, really? uh, yeah, wow. about six and a half years, roughly. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So you're about, yeah, about six years in, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Yep. Well, and um, I, I had always been, uh, you know, had a, uh, a, an interest in radio. And I, I don't know, I just never really, like, pursued it. And around uh, around late 2014, uh, the Lord had put it on my heart, you know, uh, to do a radio show. And but to do it, see what make, what makes my show different is uh, not only do I play the music from the bands and do band interviews, but I include scripture in the show. I, I will I will recite scripture in between songs, and then I end every episode of the show off with an altar call, inviting people to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. And uh, you know, I kept asking the Lord, I'm like, do you, do you want you re you want me to do this, right? Yes, yes, I want you to do this. And so I was like, okay, well, then the show's going to need a really cool name, something that kind of sticks out. The word covenant just kept coming to me, coming to me. And one day I just said it out loud. I said, covenant metal show. And I'm like, hey, that sounds kind of cool. So there you go. <laughs> That's a great example. How'd you get into graphic design and, and the, 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 the uh, lyric videos that you've done, which you've, you've done, done for us? I was about to well, say, yeah, you've done some work for us, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got into uh, graphic design, gosh, probably as far back as 2005. And, um, you know, you just, it's all self-taught. Just mm -hmm. gradually get better as time goes on. There's, I mean, I've only been using Photoshop for maybe a year and a half, two years at the most. And I still don't know everything <laughs> in it. I mean, there is so much stuff you can do. Uh, yeah. And um, as far as lyric videos, I have been doing those for like four years. I have roughly around 150 videos under my belt. And in just that time, most of the work I do is for record labels. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think I've done more for the labels than I have bands, but uh, yeah. I've done stuff. I've done other stuff, you know, for Rottweiler Records. I've done, uh, you know, I, like you said, you know, I did all three of uh, the videos for uh, for uh, Trophy Hunting for Unicorns, yeah. And um, I did um, I did a, a few Grave Robber lyric videos and some other ones. And most of you the did stuff brutality too, right? Yes, yes, uh, brutality. No, actually, I did not do any of their videos. Um, okay. 
Sorry about that. Oh, no, that's okay. I, I wish I had. I love those guys. <laughs> um, but most of my work has been for Rocks Records. I've done a lot I, of I have to say that the first time I saw what you did for Three Nails just blew me away. Oh, thank you. That that just that just nailed it. It just completely bad bad pun there. But that just completely emphasized what I was trying to, to say in that tune. And yeah. For anybody who hasn't heard it, uh, the guitar solo is Greg Hogue from Petra with uh, Mr. Schlitt doing the vocals on that. I'm actually playing three nails on the show to coincide with this uh, interview. And I'm also playing uh, Screens. Uh, oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Screens is, is uh, that's the first track on there. And what, uh, if, if I may say so, I personally have never felt like I have a evangelistic uh, ministry. What I have felt is I have a ministry towards Christians. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that I'm a teacher. Uh, I, I can sit down. I'm also a political writer, and that's where, <laughs> that's where Rhino comes from. Ah. But uh, I just really feel, especially now, we are starting to live in the last days. Yes. And everything that's happening has been foretold. Mm -hmm. And I think we still have freedom in this country, and it's time to start using it. And it's time to take a good empirical look at what's going on around you. And one of the things with screens, it sounds like, well, it's not a Christian song. Well, if you look at the lyrics, it's talking about, we spend so much time doing this, looking at our phones. You know, we, we are lost. We're slaves to technology right now. Oh, yeah. Pretty much it. I mean, technology is great when it works. Wait for it to break down. And yeah. that's what uh, one of the other uh, lyric tunes uh, when the grid goes down, the entire idea is that are you prepared for the collapse of civilization? I mean, <laughs> I couldn't laugh when I say that, but uh, we have seen so much stuff happen, like with brownouts in California yeah, and with uh, the gas crisis that hit, what, in the Northeast? That was a year or so ago, and they couldn't, they yeah. couldn't get gas. And then even around here, you know, electric rates going up and all that. And that's, that's what that song is about, too. You know, are, are you aware of what's going on? Yeah, I mean, and, and along those lines, you know, John is also, um, I think, rightly trying to spot out w w kind of what has been lost in us with, with the convenience of technology, because um, it, it can be incredibly convenient and its utility is great. Um, but there is something to be lost about knowledge and self-reliability um, and just just your ability to uh, just your ability to navigate the world um, without the incessant insistence on things like you know technology because I think most people would probably feel naked or would lack some you know direction uh, or what what to do like next in their day without their cell phone. <laughs> so something like the when the grid goes down, it's like you know saying um, there's there's really something to be lost in this like. Uh, consistent and innate reliability on, on technology which i think is very true absolutely and you talked about you said that you like anachronist i can never pronounce that anachronistic anachronism there you go yeah uh, and, and it's uh it's it's interesting because like uh when i do lyric videos for people and you know i'll listen to the song a few times i'll read the lyrics while i'm listening to a song and i'm a very visual person i i believe that you know like one thing i never liked is i've seen people do lyric videos where it's a steady background and it's just words popping up on the screen and there's nothing special to it and it's to me that's that's boring mm -hmm. so when i do the lyric videos it's like i want to give people you know not just the lyrics to read but i animate the lyrics i animate everything going on in the background i want to give you something to look at and i want to give you know present uh, uh a bigger picture of the song's message for the artist and for the listener yeah but that song's pretty unique because um um i don't you've heard the first one right you've heard the first uh, uh I may very I might have that one actually. I think Sean did send that one to me. I I'd, I'd well, have to go and check, but I felt the only valid criticism I got on it was people said, "Well, it's short." And it is. It's nine songs at 27 minutes. 
Well, I'm a real fan of the band Yes, and Yes has entire songs that are 27 minutes long. And I always felt, if I get to do another one, I'm going to take care of that problem. And one of the ways of taking care of the problem, Dan Liu, who wrote the music for Anachronism, um, I said, I want you to have a track. Whatever you want to do, it's yours. And the second tune on the album is a thing called Alone Again, written by the keyboard player, John McCorkle. And I did the same thing. I said, John, just t take a track for yourself. Do whatever you want to do. I don't care. And make it as long. I, I just simply don't care because I wanted to stretch the album out. Well, Dan came up with this wonderful rockabilly thing. I play acoustic bass on it. And Curtis does some wonderful drumming on it. And it was originally going to be an instrumental. And I, I, when we recorded that and a few other tracks, I took them over to Sean just to play the rough tracks for him. And he heard it and he fell in love with it. And he said, well, you know, it sounds like it needs lyrics. I said, well, I didn't write it. Dan did. So I'll put the two of you guys together. And Sean wrote four of the five verses and I wrote one. Dan came up with the idea for the verse and I wrote it. And it's just, we stuck it, it was Curtis's idea to stick it right in the middle of the album. You hear all this prog rock and jazz, and then out of nowhere, this thing comes fading in, and it's just pure, you know, it's Stray Cats type of stuff. And yeah. The That's... lyrics video that you did mm -hmm. just blew my mind because, I mean, where'd you find that old footage? I, I can't, I don't know how people learn how to dance like that without kicking each other in the head. <laughs> well, amazing stuff. I, I, uh, anytime I use footage like that, obviously I, I go for uh, old, you know, like copyright free stuff. You know, yeah, that way, yeah. that way I can just, you know, royalty free stuff and, and stuff sure. in the public domain so that I can, uh, you know, use that stuff. And that's, that's what I found. And e even the part in there where, you know, you got the, you got the drum fill and you got that guy just going nuts, you know, on the, on the, on yeah, the drum yeah. set. And so I was like, oh, I got to You know, and I saw that. I'm like that. That's perfect. That would fit right there. And then, you know, the band playing on stage. Uh, what I did, you see them playing, I took that little clip and then I put the same clip right behind it, but I reversed it. So they're playing and it, it just looks, you know, it looks kind of goofy in a way. If you look real close, you can notice that, ah, it's backwards. It's forward and yeah. it's backwards, mm -hmm. but yep. it, it worked. It worked, you yeah, know? Yeah, absolutely. And, we're not, uh, yeah, we're not at all afraid of goofy. <laughs> probably the hardest part of that was, um... There was a part in the song with the bass solo, and and you know you guys had wanted fingers snapping off to the side, and so I had to find that, overlay it on there, erase the background and all that. But it, it was cool when when I got it done. I'm like, oh, that's so cool that the finger snapping actually is in sync with the finger snapping in the song. So, sure. uh, but yeah, that you, you, you did great work, man. Oh, you thank really you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so we got 12 songs on here. And uh, guys, make sure that you get your hands on John DeGroff and Friends, uh, Salt 2, Trophy Hunting for Unicorns. That's available I, I'm on... I'm show you something, too. Yes. I have uh, signed copies um, signed by John Schlitt, Greg Hogue, and myself. Oh. That's available through our merch page, which uh, we'll give you that information. Well, mine is signed by you. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, you requested it, and I sent it to you. Oh yeah, so. that's that's there my that's my thing. I, I I like I like having things signed. I don't know. I'm weird like that. Sure. But uh, guys, I thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, yeah. But I, I really, it's been an honor and a blessing to have you both on the show. Can, can I say something before we go? Yeah, absolutely. Well, with, with our merch page and everything, like I said, I have copies of the first Salt record available, the new one with some signed copies. I also have, uh, this is uh, something I put out years ago. It's a collection of demos, everything from songwriter demos to actual studio quality. Bill Glover plays on a couple of them. Dan Lou's on a couple of them. And we still have uh, GHF available. Awesome. This is on all our merch page. And, uh, Ben, thank you so much for having us. God bless you guys. God bless your families. And God bless everything you do. So thank you, sir. Thank Excellent. you so much, Dave. Thank you for your video work. Thank you for do doing the show.